Hello. Right. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Hello. Big zonked. Let you guys are as well. Um, so, this is going to be our last lecture on this module. Um, and I'll upload it later on. Um, this is all about simulation narrative manufacturing. <coughs> I'm actually delighted that some of you bothered to turn up, seeing as this is not going to be part of the, the exam in any way whatsoever. So sit back, put your feet back up, and uh, try not to fall asleep. Um, we'll go through it. Um, if you want to ask any questions, go get a cup of coffee, do whatever you want. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, we've got, and I suddenly realised that uh, the coming Monday, the 7th, is a bank holiday. And that would have been, so we're going to have two examples classes, one on Friday and one week Friday on the 11th, to go through um, any of the sort of exam related worked out examples. Um, you've got a full break, breakdown, there's nothing anything particularly new in there, but what I will do is go through a few of those on Friday, pick out a few select ones for obvious reasons, and then a few select ones a week Friday as well. But on the Monday, you're aware that there is nothing, there is a bank holiday, because I've only just realised now. <laughs> so luckily, I, I booked this other, the Friday session in the Grand Hall anyway, so we, we can do the, the examples class, and I think two is more than enough. If you think you need more, then we'll just organise an office hour and we can sit down in the office hour and go over there, uh, that instead. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Right, so um, talking about modelling, is why model at all? I'm going to go over some of the difficulties of modelling this particular process um, and then some examples of applications where modelling has been used so far. Um, end up talking a little bit about future directions because modeling is where this will go um, and it's playing catch up a little bit with other processes it's very new machines are developing all the time and uh, you know full multi-scale modeling is not something which you can get working overnight it takes time um, so typically we look at the applications from a couple of different um, areas one will be to look at uh, developing the process or process modeling and the other is at the level of the component so because we can we're using a laser which has only something in the order of 70 microns even smaller sometimes 55 micron beam widths up to 150 microns down the laser powder bed um, it's very difficult to see what's going on so there are videos and in situ x-ray tomography and but literally the results are coming out and, they, and often they are not quite representative of the process so when you can't actually see something and you have to process the material or cut it up afterwards to do a post-mortem and you have to kind of guess what happened during the melting and certification it's actually very difficult to uh, model um, it's multi-physics and multi-scale Multi-physics, we've already been through this uh, during the chapter 5, uh, we looked at the physics of the, you know, you've all sorts of different thermal and thermal fluidic um, sides of the physics, the, the, the phase change, it, it melts, it solidifies, it sometimes vaporizes, um, and it's multi-scale because even if you can model something down at the level of the laser, um, thermally, you still need to do a lot of touchdown on the lines of a single laser, and then you've got to cover an entire area and the process of actually building, physically building will take 60 hours and the simulation of a single one millimeter square could take five days so if you start to work out what a full component would be like to simulate it down at that level of the laser it would take years years of modeling time to be able to capture in that kind of detail at that level so you need to somehow approximate that across the scales and that's what we mean by multi-scale so you often do a simulation on a very sub sub scale approximate that and lift that up to from a millimeter to tens of millimeters and then hopefully you have something that you can model an entire component um, 
the geometries don't help because we can make them so complicated um, that actually that just adds a lot of level complexity to the models themselves. Um, plus the support structures, and then the combinations of support structures you could have to pick out the optimal mean that actually you wouldn't want to just model it once. You'd want to model it a hundred times with different orientations. And so the level of computing power which allows us to do that right across the entire scales just isn't there at the moment. Um, and, and possibly never will be, so we have to make approximations. Um, coming from the other side there, looking at the components themselves, um, then there's the optimization through topological optimization using finite element is a relatively well established. Uh, we do a lot of that here at Swansea. Um, we've worked a lot on the de development of algorithms for topological optimization. But saying that it works well at the level of a PhD student developing codes that links meshes together and so on is one thing. And another thing is a push of the button system which takes a CAD topologically optimizes it, returns the CAD to a topologically optimized feature, does the stress analysis, and then incorporates all the fabrication designs that you guys have been through in your projects, where you orientate it with different build directions. That isn't there, and that's a lot more complicated. And companies like BAE um, and um, Airbus um, are working in on, on integrated optimization that takes the, the process into, but they're not there. So things you'd have to take into account would be possibly the anisotropy materials, maybe some porosity coming in there, the fact that if you build in one direction, you don't get the same strength properties if you build in the other. And therefore throughout the entire component, which might be zigzagging its way out the builds, you can have a variation of mechanical properties from one side to the other. And those need to be integrated. You can't just put one single Young's modulus or one single yield strength. It's anisotropic and that makes it a bit more complicated. So <coughs> there are reasons still for modeling. Um, there's no simple engineering calculations. Uh, unlike with maybe casting, which has been around for many years, you can um, make some ballpark, in fact, you know, you can make ballpark estimates about the thickness of seconds and how much you have to overstock the level of shrinkage you would expect in certain parts of a casting. Uh, and that's not to say that you don't use simulation in casting as well. Um, but that, there's nothing simple that we can just use as a rule of thumb to design AM parts. Um, so you have noticed with your parts that you may be off, um, you know, significantly off on some of the hex shapes that you've made. Maybe your hex ball doesn't quite fit and there's been uneven shrinkage in different areas. Yeah? So that is not going to get much better by throwing a model at it because you can't understand completely the physics of the model to be able to do it. So that's where it's still a long way away. Uh, potentially, uh, eventually, if we can develop those models, and there's uh, various companies working on the development of those models. So there's one called ESI Group, who have coming up with their additive manufacturing, ESI additive manufacturing software, which is meant to have an integrated multi-scale um, uh, system. There's also another company recently in the States um, which has sold itself to ANSYS. So ANSYS has an additive module which is coming into it, which has various levels of um, uh, various scales of simulation. Eventually, if we get that right, then the potential uh, for the reduction of costs is there. Of You don't have to do iterative builds on the, on the part, you can get it right first time. But it also brings in the possibility of multifunctional parts designed with multiple objectives in mind and still be able to get it right first time. So, uh, you know, for example, one of those would be that you could reduce the weight without affecting the strength in any way whatsoever. Um, that's a very simple, uh, but you could also enhance it so that it had heat transfer characteristics that you want as well. Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of um, reason for developing the models, but they're certainly not there. As you would expect with a technology which is really, although it's been around for about 20, 25, 30 years, is not a manufacturing process yet. So you can't just walk into any of the factories around here and find a powder bed system that's working and that's pumping out parts. You know, um, So it's a long way from it. Um, we have talked about the cooling rates 
so those these specific cooling rates, high cooling rates, quite difficult to capture, uh, and the range of length scales make it awkward as well. And uh, just uh, turn down. <coughs> so yeah, this just looking through the window um, at a build. Um, you can see the speed which the laser is working. I mean, I, I know, did you guys have a chance to look in through the window while it, was, uh, while it was running? No? Well, this is more or less what you'd see in, in uh, normal, normal speed. Um, so you've got to think that is tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individual fires of the, of the laser across what is a relatively small uh, part there on the right I'm talking about, the normal camera. And the one on the left is on a high speed uh, visualization um, where <coughs> another difficulty of the process is that it's not, even if you get the physics all right down at the level of modeling it down at the mount pool, you actually realize that what you can simulate is very tranquil melting and it has, it has very little to do with what you actually see through um, even through the relatively uh, crude m methods of filming this, uh, you see a very explosive uh, nature of the process on the left here, with lots of spatter and particles being thrown out. There's plumes where there's semi vaporization of the material coming off. Uh, you've got interaction with the gas. So that is a long way. From the, from the modeling that is being done. Um, it's not all being captured. Um, some people go further. Um, we, we basically, on the whole, work with three different scales. So you've got the small micron size modeling where we actually look at the individual melting of powders across a small section of geometry, maybe 100 microns by 100 microns, or maybe even a millimeter by 100 mil by, by a, maybe 10 millimeters by 100 millimeters, so relatively small um, simulations that take into account the full physics of melting. Um, then you'll have the hatch model where you ignore the individual part of particles and you look sort of more specifically at um, the the laser passing back and forward basically across a flat area and you're looking at the, trying to replicate the temperatures and thermal and maybe start looking at localized uh, residual stress uh, from these models as well. And this gives you a, this gives you a capability of maybe looking at different types of hatch patterns and whether or not they um, have higher levels of stress or not. And then we have what we call the layer, ma layer model or the sort of macro models um, where we're looking to try to model the entire component um, with finite element possibly, with small enough elements, you know, a millimeter or two millimeters across, um, and putting on, plastering onto that element the thermal, uh, some sort of thermal history without actually solving the thermal history. And that takes away a lot of the, um, you, you don't need to sort of solve all of these micro models to be able to do that. And that um, will give you some idea of the stresses which are involved left um, within the component. So here are a whole bunch of um, sort of different simulations at different scales. Um, you've got uh, different models that are used, Lattice Boltzmann, um, the software ESIAM. This is actually done in Fluent, which shows a bead of powder being melted and you can see the sort of convection currents within the bead itself. Uh, the bottom one is a 3D simulation of something similar which shows the melt pool and uh, just a sort of dispersion of um, balls that look a bit like, well they haven't, haven't spent much time putting, but you're also putting the powder down. There's um, DEM models being developed here at Swansea. They're being integrated into the ESIAM software to be able to actually get a distribution of particles across the surface before you do the melt. Um, 3D finite difference model, a fluent 3D model, and, uh, and then sort of looking at the sort of micro scale, looking at what happens when you've got different impurities in them. They're just, just examples of the modeling. Um, um, so, so the modeling ha goes back quite a way, more onto the sort of sintering side back in the early 90s. Um, and then slowly, and you work your way through all these different papers, you can see that they're kind of getting more sophisticated. Um, and Probably about around about 2014, some of the first multi-scale models coming forward that um, we're talking about now. Um, 
it will probably be another five five years, three or five years, ten years maybe before everything is integrated and working really well. But if you think about the way that casting, uh, so the simulation of casting went starting sort of in the mid-70s, it wasn't really until sort of mid-2000s that um, a lot of the casting software could be said to work uh, in such a way as to be able to predict uh, accurately. So yeah, that's a relatively quick um, sort of uh, development of the models. Um, this shows the importance of including uh, not just buoyancy convection, but convection such as Marignoni that we talked about as well, which is, so there is no, the hill, in this simulation on the right here, they've got no um, natural convection. All this convection is driven by temperature differentials along the uh, interface between the melt and the solid and it shows that you can still get a lot of recirculation within the melt pool, which is based just upon um, uh, the Mangroni convection. Again, this is uh, just a simulation of a bead formation um, there. And if you look at that, that's done in Fluent, uh, which you've all got access to. And it, doesn't, it just takes a bit of playing around with all the different models in Fluent to be able to do that. But you can see that that shape of the bead and the uh, resulting um, sort of a elliptical heat affected zone underneath it is quite similar in principle. A lot of uh, trickeries in the model to make that work and a lot of parameters which we don't necessarily have measured or access to. Um, that was done on a slightly bigger um, sort of a laser with a 1.8 mil um, diameter. Um, a 2D example doing the same. Uh, it just shows you the potential capabilities. This is with, you know, now with smaller, potentially with aluminium powder, that sort of melting point. And you can see how um, you get sort of the surface tension effects are causing uh, this kind of bridging and uh, wetting angle at the bottom. And you can see a sort of the surface solidifying and a bit of porosity left over underneath where the laser hasn't gone down enough. Um, and this is the problem with modeling, <coughs> is that sometimes you can model it with very complex physics and you look at it and you go, wow, yeah, that makes sense. And you start looking at how things have happened and you know, there's so much complexity in there and um, you don't even know if your mesh is good enough for the resolution that you solved it at. And you can start to read into things and you go, oh yeah, look, that looks like balling happening there, or that could be a satellite forming there, or is that an exploding particle shooting off into space? semi synth particles, all these things that we see after we've done a melt with a laser. Um, actually, maybe they're all wrong, you know, but it gives you a starting point, something to look at, um, and um, you know, sometimes the formation, the most important stuff is if you're trying to get rid of porosities to see how it forms, and that possibly the physics is capturing okay. Um, even simple things, you, know, you think, well, that looks really simple. I'll take a distribution of powder particles of different sizes, and I'm just going to drop them into a pot and see how they rearrange themselves actually takes a long time <laughs> and it was quite comp complicated in models to be able even to capture that sort of thing. Um, this is uh, something which uh, Professor Brown, Mark Holmes and, and a few others at Swansea have been working on for a while and this is something which is being integrated into uh, the ESI AM software um, which is probably a first for Swansea University, not a first but it's, it's certainly uh, a really good thing for um, Swansea to actually have had a piece of code be integrated within a commercial code. And this, this is showing how you can pass a wiper across and you look at the distribution and they're all colored small particles are red, large particles are blue. That's uh, discrete element modeling. And on the basis of that, you can um, set up a distribution of particles like that and you can look at the effect of melting it um, doing a single line scan like that. Why is that useful? Because it helps you understand things like balling and the uh, poor formation of tracks, which um, 
we can inherently do quite quickly on the machine itself in terms of process maps, but we don't necessarily understand why it is that certain powders with certain distributions um, will, will boil up before others. And a lot of it comes down to the thermal properties of the material and the powders and so on. And, and the model helps you understand it. Um, so um, certainly as far as optimizing uh, a, a specific material, once you get these kind of models working properly, then it's a way of getting that extra level of optimization. Um, these are just two-dimensional examples of layers being put down, and you can see with and without marangoni convection being included. Um, with the marangoni, you tend to get larger um, melt pools, more recirculation going on, um, and slightly denser part. Um, So the only real way to get any model know whether it's working or not is to uh, get some concrete evidence. I wouldn't say this is the most concrete evidence, but using that model on the left, uh, those model I just showed you now, the two-dimensional ones, we were able to show that for different um, power inputs for the laser, you can get a densification, uh, you get less porosity. Um, and that compares to what you've seen earlier about what we get physically. So you do get that, although it doesn't tend to drop off when you go into the really high values. But it's only that is not very, not a very well put together comparison, but kind of helps. Now, in terms of the simulations, and it's most basic, um, we want to solve the, um, the Fourier equation. And we'll put in a, a laser distribution using a, power, uh, a heat source, QR. Um, this will come into the right hand side of the equation or as a boundary condition. Um, and this is the sort of modeling that you can do quite easily. Um, I think some of you may have done the materials and the thermal modeling with Professor Brown. Yeah, no, yeah, well, he, he likes doing this kind of thing quite a bit. Uh, and, um, you know, it doesn't take, this is not a very sophisticated model, but it's enough to be able to capture. It's, it's, it'll capture more than you think, and I'll show you some of the examples now. Especially if you start to include very realistic material properties that have been measured with temperature functions, you can look at things like different hatch patterns, and uh, um, these are some examples of uh, just a laser. Um, just looking down on the three-dimensional simulation. Just touching down in different places, so it's not moving quite as fast as the one we're looking through the window, but it's starting to look more like it. It's on a big enough scale that you can sort of start to make correlations and similarities. So, um, yeah, if you spend enough time looking at these models, you can look at these temperatures in different zones, different um, hatch patterns, and looking at sort of the peaks and troughs of different hatch patterns. Um, and if you take the model and you develop a little bit further, and this is this took a bit longer, was when you start to actually try to model the key holding. So if you remember, we were talking about the um, uh, different modes that you get a melting. Uh, here's on the left-hand side, you can see a uh, a, a balled-up bead of uh, powder, um, a solidified melt track, which is not really adhered to the to the base plate. Here you can see. Um, what would be considered a much more optimal melt, which has got a conductive um, mode melting underneath the bead and a sort of relatively nice uh, top part. And then on the right-hand side, you can see one where the, um, the laser energy density has been a bit too much, and it's, uh, it's formed a keyhole. And it's drilled its way through what would essentially be a number of different layers. And this is the kind of uh, mode of melting that you would prefer to be Avoiding. So this is the one that forms when um, you get a bit of evaporation starts, and you get a plasma forming above the melt pool, and then you you get a, um, a knock-on effect where the laser hits the plasma, and the plasma acts as a lens, and it keeps on penetrating through. Again, so it doesn't it doesn't allow the uh, laser energy back out, so it keeps on reflecting around in the cavity, and it ends up making a much deeper cavity than you'd want. And if you look at it down from the top, this is uh, the top one corresponds to this track, the middle one corresponds to that track, and this rather wide uh, track at the bottom corresponds to this track. Um, and <clears throat> even with that relatively simple model, we were able to capture that key holding effect. So going from you know, just solving the Fourier and just the thermal, you can get some um, quite close answers.
And it's just another example of what to do. But <coughs> um, how you link that up from the, and you put it together, that will help you understand your process maps and how to avoid keyholing, maybe how to avoid balling, which happens at the other extreme. Um, but whether you could do that quite easily and quicker than you could by just putting the powder in the machine is still negotiable. So I mean, you could still be running those for weeks on end with a single powder. Yeah, that was a question I had. So because all, all of what I can see is basically some cool graphs, but how effective is that in terms of manufacturing? Do you think it's actually going to make it easier or is it not going to be as effective as just trying it out and testing it, especially in ALM? The, how effective is the modeling going to be? Or? Yeah. Um, well, at the moment, well, the, the place I think where a lot of modelers on this are at the moment is on the validation. So um, I think there's still a lot of different materials to try out first before we can say we've sold it for all powders. So ideally, you know, you'd be able to take a teeny amount of powder measure thermal properties of it on some equipment, take the properties, put them into the model, predict the process map, and t send it back to manufacturer. So then you have to make tiny little samples, and you would be able to eventually come up with a composition and a powder strategy, powder sizes, that, was, that would work brilliantly first time, but a long way from that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so that's the thermal modeling to show you that even relatively simple models can give you some insights. Uh, so, um, but how you use those insights is still not clear. Um, how they would relate to properties that you're actually interested in, like the residual stress, how to predict the distortion and the, therm and the residual stresses, that's still not um, clear. This is a different type of modeling, and I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because you all know CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Yeah, so this is looking at the gas inside the machine. So there is some correlation between the gases. And as with welding, if you use different types of gases, you can get different types of melt pools. And uh, within the machine, you've got constraints that you want to pass through the gas from the inlet to the outlet quick enough that it will take away uh, condensate and spatter and all the impurities. But you don't want it so quick that it moves the powder. So they've come up with a, a one meter per second flow rate over the top of the powder, and they think that's about optimal. So that means that you have to sort of uh, make sure that the design of the nozzles that comes in is done in such a way that you can get that speed across the powder bed. Because when you don't, you can actually show there's a correlation with the mechanical properties. So if your flow rates are too high, um, you have patchy um, mechanical results. And if it's too low, you get a lot of impurities and spatter and um, things going into it. So um, that's part of the reason. This is a sort of typical fun element, um, uh, fluent um, mesh being used. There's the cavity there. You've got the inlet on the right and the outlet on the left. Um, just some th properties of the fluids. Um, and <coughs> you can see, I think, on the left here, at the top, this is um, hot wire anem anemometry of the gas flow through the uh, chamber. And then there's various different turbulence models. I'm going to bore you with all the um, different results. Some are better than others. Um, quite a lot of noise. Um, but what it does do is it allows you to get a, um, a visualization of the flow which is happening inside the cavity. And then also, of course, you can pick up um, hot spots on the plate where the gas is moving slightly faster. Um, and that itself is quite helpful for whoever's designing the, um, uh, the, the nozzles here. Um, so one of, the, one of my uh, PhD students who's finishing just right now at the moment, he has designed quite a few different out, um, uh, nozzles, and um, some seem to work better than others. Um, so that's another application of modeling within, within additive is to look at the process, and then uh, residual stress uh, modeling. So again, this is something that you can do yourself in, in ANSYS, uh, but it will, you will quickly find that where you get to is the difficulty of being able to, how you couple the thermal 
history with the um, uh, with a transient structural model. Um, this shows some single lines, so you can see the thermal profile, and then you can see the stress profile following the thermal uh, profile as the laser goes from left to right. But that is literally for 10 millimeters, one single line, and you've got kilometers of those lines in the simulation to go up through. So um, there are ways of simplifying that, um, and that is what they is a more pragmatic way of doing it. There, we're solving everywhere for the temperature as we go along, and then doing a residual stress at each step. There are ways by which you take full elements, and you say, well, I'm not bothered about the peaks and troughs of the temperature within that one millimeter squared. Let's just say it all melts, and you just put the melt temperature on, and then you let it cool, and then you do it for the next element, and next element, and that way you only have um, and that's probably the coarsest level. And um, these uh, models put forward by the American company, which are now being integrated into ANSYS, do that exactly they, uh, as their coarsest model. You just do a standard finite element on the plate, and you can um, basically um, uh, do this coarse level simulation, maybe with different support structures in it and so on. Um, that is free. That, that version of software is free. Um, I don't know how well it works. The guys have been trying it over the last couple of months, um, but it is pretty crude. So how helpful it is, I don't know. Maybe next year on some of your projects, maybe I'll get someone to have a look at it and see if it's any good. Um, but the real excitement with the modeling comes around this idea of being able to integrate the entire design circle virtually without having to go to the physical build. Um, so <clears throat> this is uh, just a few um, clips from uh, an exercise that we did a couple of years ago. On a, uh, it was a competition by GE, which was uh, crowdsourced. Uh, they put a competition out for, I think it was uh, $10,000 plus a free build in AM to whoever came up with the best design. And the idea was they gave you a series of uh, constraints um, so it's your design brief, the design brief there, um, and they had three different loadings that they had to be, um, they gave you a design envelope, which was basically what it would be normally done if it was machined, um, and within that, you could do anything you wanted, as long as it retained the strength, and ideally, to be able to win, you'd have the lowest weight. So, uh, this is where uh, we were using um, ANSYS for the finite element stress analysis with Altair um, Optistruct doing uh, the um, topological optimization. And at that point there was a really difficult bit because although, and this was a few years back now, I think things have got slightly better. Um, we had a lot of problems and we managed to, in fact, the way that we did this was sort of draw over the top of an existing topologically optimized part a new CAD drawing, redo the final element, put it into, into the equivalent of Quant-AM, which was autofab in those days, and look at the support structure and then go back and see. Um, ideally, all of this would be linked up nice and smoothly all the way through. Well, that's not the case, but it is getting closer. So um, uh, ANSYS have got a, uh, in version 18, um, they've got, they use space claim, and space claim uh, has some topological optimization. Well, ANSYS has got topological optimization, which is linked to space claim, which then shrink fits a surface mesh over the topologically optimized solution, which can then be exported back into ANSYS, and you almost get the closed loop. Although, the critical bit that's still missing is being able to pull in material properties which are machine dependent, which is at this stage over here. So that would really take you back to the first stage and then you'd run it again with the new properties in and you would start to look across the design space in terms of um, the... But that is relatively close, if not already being done within Airbus already with their own system of doing it. Um, but that is the excitement of it. And with that, uh, you may have seen one of the parts that we have made. This was the first start of that sequence, so this is going back. Uh, even by the end of 2009, they didn't have the, uh, the full 
manufacturing constraints being built into the cycle. But certainly as far as the topological optimization, they were able to show that for something which had uh, a reduction in weight of almost 60%, you could have exactly the same properties on a part that you couldn't make in any other way. So this is what I was trying to drag out of you guys with your uh, bottle openers. Uh, but I think that would have been a bit too much to ask for. Um, here's something a bit more uh, straightforward. So this is uh, some of the um, group projects from last year. Uh, they looked at the design of <coughs> the cooling channels for um, an, um, an injection molding core. And they looked at how they could um, build the um, the part with the cooling channels inside, so that they were self-supporting, um, and you know as close as possible to the interface where the polymer is, so that you can get additional thermal um, control. And they, they did a really nice job. Um, we haven't printed the part yet, but I think that was the the plan for this year. But I don't think it's happened. Um, um, but this is being done quite regularly, and um, it's certainly something which isn't going to kill anybody if it doesn't work. Um, so, um, I think we've pretty much covered most of this um, as we've gone along. So, uh, yeah, um, it is early days, and um, I think that the the eventual convergence of the technology of 3D printing with the virtual modeling and design is going to be incredibly powerful when it actually happens. That's it. Any questions? Well, you could have brought along the, uh, some of the uh, examples, worked examples. Can you go through those now? <laughs> <laughs>